uh, honorable ministers and distinguished guests on behalf of the Asian Development Bank, the World Health Organization, and the Japan Ministry of Finance, I would like to welcome you to the Joint Ministers of Finance and Health Symposium on Universal Health Coverage. My name is Patrick Osewe. I'm the Chief of the Health Sector Group at ADB, and I'm honored to be the MC for today uh, for these important proceedings. Asia and the Pacific has achieved tremendous economic and health gains over the past 50 years, but the COVID-19, uh, the con pandemic threatens to undermine the progress. However, the pandemic is also prompting our region and the global community to come together and collaborate like never before, with the recognition that health is a fundamental driver of economic growth, prosperity, and security. Today marks a historic meeting and builds on this understanding. And it's the first time the Ministers of Finance and the Minister of Health are coming together in our region during a pandemic to discuss how we can invest in the health system. In this spirit of collaboration, I'm pleased to call this meeting to order and to invite Mr. Taro Aso, Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Finance of Japan, to share a few thoughts. Good morning and good afternoon to the distinguished participant. Well, you might have known already our government, Prime, Prime Minister Abe, resigned and we chose the cabinet secretary of the Abe cabinet, Suga Yoshihide, is a new Prime Minister of Japan. Fortunately, unfortunately, I am reappointed as a Deputy Prime Minister and Finance Minister as it is now. I need to present myself at the diet desperately. So please allow me to deliver my message through this video. It is a great pleasure to part of this morning important event today. Today, as my opening remark for the symposium, I would like to briefly touch upon the renewed importance of UHC, especially in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. The COVID-19 pandemic has shed light on the importance of the preparedness and response against the future pandemics in ensuring the sustainable economic growth. At the initial stage of the pandemic, many countries took containment measures such as lockdown and the travel restriction, which have severely affected the economy. As countries have began easing these measures, we all face now a very difficult challenge for maintaining the right balance between COVID-19 containment and smooth economic recovery. To keep such a right balance, countries are required to establish a robust health system that are able to test and detect the infected people promptly, trace their contact with other people, and isolate them properly while providing the quality medical treatment. Progressing toward the UHC paves, the way for establishing such a robust health system. Under the Japanese presidency, G20 agreed on the importance of promoting UHC in Osaka last year. More specifically, five elements are necessary to realize the both containment of the pandemic and smooth economic recovery. One, sufficient human resources for health. Two, high quality infrastructure for health and relevant sectors. Three, inclusive coverage of health service, including in rural area and for vulnerable people. Four, quality health services including the sufficient supply of vaccine, drugs, and medical equipment, and five, financing the mechanism 
that allows everyone to access a quality health service at the affordable cost. How could health and finance minister contribute to achieving EUHC? While health ministers are in charge of designing the high quality, equitable and inclusive health policy, they alone can complete this important mission. Finance minister have a joint responsibility in designing and securing sustainable financing sources for health system. It is clear now that investment in the health system is crucial for sustainable development. Close collaboration between the two ministers is thus essential in achieving UHC. Finally, I would like to emphasize the important role of the ADB in achieving the UHC. It was very <coughs> encouraging that ADB President Mr. Sakawa's vision statement highlighting UHC. Promotion as one of the eight development <coughs> charities of the Asia Pacific region. In April, Japan announced a contribution of 150 million US dollars to support ADB's activities in response to COVID-19. We will strengthen our collaboration with ADB, expecting that ADB as a regional family doctor would uncover the assistance need of the region and play a leading role in the promoting UHC. I hope that participants of this symposium will have a constructive discussion based on the less <coughs> lesson learned from the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you for your participation. Thank you so much, uh, Deputy Prime Minister, for your insightful thoughts and comments. Now it's my honor to introduce President Masasugu Asakawa of the Asian Development Bank. President Masa, please. Yes, uh, Deputy Prime Minister Tarawaso, uh, thank you very much for your uh, very insightful uh, video message, despite your uh, extremely uh, busy schedule. Uh, finance ministers, uh, health ministers, distinguished guests, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It is an honor and privilege to open uh, this Joint Ministers of Finance and Health Symposium on Universal Health Coverage in Asia and the Pacific, COVID-19 and beyond. In June uh, 2019, when I was still with the Japanese uh, Ministry of Finance, I helped organize uh, the highly impactful G20 Ministers of Finance and Health meeting. This included uh, the preparation of the G20 shared understanding on the importance of UHC financing in developing countries. By bringing together the Ministers of Finance and Health, we have seen how such joint meetings can help uh, mobilize sustained financing for universal health uh, coverage, a priority of many countries. As president of the ADB, uh, let me show my renewed commitment that the ADB makes all out efforts uh, in helping countries fight against the COVID-19 pandemic while continuing to support governments in Asia and the Pacific, build and evolve UHC as a foundation of strong and sustainable health systems. The COVID-19 pandemic is a significant threat uh, to development and the poverty reduction in Asia and the Pacific. As of today, our region has nearly 6 million people infected and more than 100,000 deaths, with the majority being elderly people or those with underlying chronic health conditions. The outbreak has led to closed borders, de decreased trade and investments, and reduced tourism, which resulted in massive loss of jobs. ADB estimates that three quarters of our DMCs will experience economic contraction in 2020, this year uh, due to the COVID-19 pandemic. ADB has been assisting its developing uh, economies in, in the fight against COVID-19 from the earliest stages of the outbreak. We provided 
uh, grant resources to help governments procure urgently needed medical and personal protective equipment and testing kits. Then in April, we announced a 20 billion US dollar package of assistance. As of mid-September now, ADB has already committed about $11.2 billion for COVID-19 operations. Of this, $8.2 billion was provided through quick disbursing budget support under a new financing modality called the COVID-19 Pandemic Response Option or CIPRO, CPRO. In addition, co-financing worth about $7.2 billion was mobilized. Developing economies have used our loan, grant, and technical assistance to support increased testing and treatment of COVID-19, expand risk communications, and upgrade health infrastructure, including isolation facilities and critical care units. We have supported vulnerable populations, including women and children, by helping governments to expand their social protection schemes. Our timely support to the private sector also helped ensure uh, that the essential medical supplies and personal protective equipment are manufactured and delivered. In close collaboration with de development partners, we are supporting developing economies in assessing safe and effective COVID-19 vaccines at affordable costs and improving their vaccine delivery systems. Taken together, this support is helping countries manage and mitigate the health and economic impacts of the pandemic. As we help countries address the pandemic, we should not lose sight of the challenges of the rising burden of non-communicable diseases, worsening income inequality, changing demography, and deteriorating fiscal sustainability. We have to build health systems where people from all walks of life, including the elderly, the poor, and the vulnerable, can access health services at an affordable cost while maintaining this our health system's financial sustainability, even in aging societies that many countries in Asia and the Pacific are heading towards. Our collective experience of the fight against the pandemic speaks volumes about why we must also ensure that UHC is financially sustainable and inclusive to all. In this regard, close collaboration between finance and health ministers is crucial for our member economies to provide cost-effective, inclusive, and high-quality health interventions underpinned by sustainable finance. Once again, ADB remains committed to strengthening health systems with the goal of reaching UHC, and I hope that today's symposium will help all participants gain practical knowledge and in higher level momentum to achieve and evolve, evolve UHC. To conclude, let me acknowledge the excellent collaboration between the government of Japan, World Health Organization, and ADB in furthering dialogue on UHC in Asia and the Pacific. Let me reaffirm to you today that ADB stands ready to continue providing our DMCs with sustained support to fight COVID-19 and achieve universal health coverage. Thank you very much for your attention. Patrick, back to you. Thank you very much, uh, President uh, Massa, uh, for your strong commitment uh, and uh, leadership. Uh, at ADB, uh, just to emphasize what uh, President Massa has just talked about, uh, we have a very close collaboration with the World Health Organization uh, to accelerate progress towards uh, UHC. Uh, I'm therefore uh, very proud to invite uh, Dr. Takeshi Kasai, the Regional Director for WHO Western Pacific, to set the scene for our first session, which is looking at lessons learned from COVID-19. Dr. Kasai, please. Thank you very much, Patrick. Honorable Deputy Prime Minister Aso, uh, congratulations for your reappointment, sir. ADB President, Mr. Asakawa, WHO Regional Director, Dr. Shin, Excellency Ministers. We are in a unique moment in time, not only because of the pandemic, but because the pandemic has created the condition in which we have the opportunity to make a choice that changes our future. 
COVID-19 has focused our collective attention on the importance of health. The human and economic costs of the pandemic have been devastating, which has reinforced the connection between good health and economic security. At the same time, individuals and governments are each finding that they have a new roles and responsibility in securing and maintaining good health all all. Against the backdrop, we have a choice to make about whether we use these difficult lessons from the pandemic to build healthier, more sustainable societies and economies. Doing this requires recommitment to financing and achieving universal health coverage by 2030 to support economic growth and transform health system to meet the future challenges of our region. I believe history will judge us very harshly if we do not make this choice. Earlier this week, Minister and Vice Minister of Health from 24 countries across Asia and the Pacific met to discuss the path to the universal health coverage in 2030. We discussed how the strong response of countries in our region to COVID-19 are the dividends of past investment in health and health security. Many countries in our region have managed to avoid large-scale community transmission thanks to past improvements in primary healthcare system, health financing reforms that have expanded financial protection and strengthening of core public health security function. All of these reforms enabled by the support of ministries of finance laid the foundation for the current pandemic response. We must bear this in mind as we weigh up a new future beyond COVID-19. Investing in health have a significant economic benefit. Financing universal health coverage contribute to economic growth. It reduces poverty by supporting people to get an education, gain employment, and be economically productive. And the health sector itself is a major employer. Investment in health can therefore be a driver for economic recovery. At the same time, additional investment in health should not come without reform or transformation. The increased burden of non-communicable diseases and the demands placed on health services by rapidly aging population demand far-reaching transformation of the health sector to deliver universal health coverage while ensuring the health expenditure is sustainable and his health system are fit for the future. We have long known about the link between good health and the economy. But this COVID-19 has exposed current weakness and gap in our health system, making the task of reform even more urgent. Now is the time to act on this knowledge by recommitting to financing and achieving universal health coverage and ensuring that every additional dollar spent on health returns a dividend in countries' future productivities and economic development. These are the choices we face in the COVID-19 moment. I sincerely hope this meeting today will help lead us to the right choice. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Kasai, for those remarks. Uh, I would now like to introduce Dr. Gabriel Leung, uh, who will be our moderator for today's uh, proceedings. Uh, Dr. Leung is a Dean of Medicine at uh, the University of Hong Kong and is one of the leading epidemiologists uh, in Asia and globally. Uh, he's play, he played a very uh, pivotal role during the SARS epidemic in 2003 and the avian influenza in 2009, and as a key figure in Hong Kong response to COVID-19. I now turn to uh, Dr. Leung to facilitate our first session uh, to discuss lessons learned in COVID-19. 
Dr. Leon, please. Thank you very, very much indeed, uh, Patrick. And uh, after the inspiring opening remarks by the Prime Minister Aso, by President Asagawa, and also by Dr. Kasai just now, we now move on to the first of two panels today. This one is concerned about what lessons we've learned from the current pandemic. And specifically, we are going to hear on the following four themes. One, what were the health security activities that really better prepared some countries for their COVID-19 response so far? What were some of the financing mechanisms that had been used for successful COVID-19 response, especially during the current period of reduced government revenue? What are the public health systems, for example, for surveillance and for clinical service delivery that's been needed for an effective response? And finally, what financing innovations have been used to address COVID-19 and what can be applied to pandemic preparedness and UHC going forward for the autumn winter waves of COVID-19 and beyond. We are absolutely honored that we have four ministers who will be participating and contributing in this panel. We have two ministers of finance and two ministers of health. From Vietnam, we have Minister Zong. From the Philippines, we have Minister Dominguez. From Sri Lanka, we have a health minister, Wani Arachi, and from the Republic of Korea, we have Minister Park. So without further ado, may I now pass the time and invite each of the ministers to give some opening prefacing remarks. And then if we have time left, we will address some of the questions from the audience. So now may I please invite from Sri Lanka, Minister Wani Arachi. Good morning, Excellencies and distinguished participants. At the outset, I would like to say that Sri Lanka has successfully dealt with many hazards, disasters, and emergencies over the years. The experience gained has resulted down the line in identifying policies, strategies, plans, and systems that we continue to improve and adopt. The International Health Regulations of 2005 that was adapted by all WHO member states, including Sri Lanka, has clearly guided, guided us to move towards stronger health systems to respond to adverse health events. The Disaster Management Act of 2005, National Action Plan for Health Security 2019, the National Influenza Pandemic Preparedness Plan, the National Immunization Policy, the National Vaccine Deployment Plan, the National Disaster Management Plan are some of the active strategic measures in place. As they were in place, they have created a culture within the health and other sectors managed through the National Disaster Management Center to activate any response that reaches alert level. The foundation of a well-designed public health architecture that has protected us through many a public health challenge played a vital role in the response towards COVID-19 too. Sri Lanka was able to respond promptly capitalizing on this system. National security was ensured with exercising highest level authorization to take prompt action. A special national task force to control COVID-19 was set up under the guidance of a chief president of Sri Lanka. Incorporating the strength of the National Disaster Management Center this was held under the joint chairmanship of the commander of the army and me as the Minister of Health, supported by all relevant health ministry officials. Public health activities are usually delivered through 
decentralized system. Under this situation, I was able to coordinate with all nine provincial ministers of health and we had a unified response for the country. I believe that one of our valuable assets is the capacities already developed, developed of our health workforce for emergencies, not only in health, but also in the tri forces. The communities were also engaged in the response with the support of trained civil society organizations and local leaders. With this support, our public health system at the grassroots level could vigorously act in contact tracing, quarantine measures, and performing rational PCR testing. In our response, the government took responsibility to manage all patients within the government health delivery system. For this, several categories of hospital staff were rapidly trained. It is noteworthy that to date, we have only 13 deaths reported and none amongst our health care workers. Despite the burden on the government health system, we were able to maintain the su supply of drugs. Also, we were able to deliver to the doorstep the essential drugs for patients with chronic NCDs, TB, HIV, and filariasis. While strengthening all precautionary measures at the port of entry, we were able to ensure safe quality testing very early in the response and our medical research institute established a molecular test and validated this through the WHO coronavirus reference laboratory. To, to achieve 100% concordance, the number of laboratories has increased to 22 with the ADB supporting. The establishment of a laboratory that has the capacity to do 1,000 tests per day. We also had the support of our nationwide free suicide ambulance services that was able to transport those suspected from home to designated isolation hospitals. The COVID-19 pandemic today has made us realize that the future investment has to continue to keep preparedness levels high and keep the public vigilance on precautions. The government has also invested in a social marketing campaign for the new normal, which was launched very recently. This is also being done with the support from the government, the WHO, UNICEF, Rotary, and several private sector organizations. At high alert disaster situation in the past, Sri Lanka has also benefited from the WHO Southeast Asian Region Health Emergency Fund. In this response, in this response many sectors and agencies have supported. The Ministry of Health and Ministry of Finance must continue to work together in future, strengthening our health systems as the past investments truly played a significant role. Thank you. Thank you very, very much indeed, Minister, for your very enlightening sharing of the Sri Lankan experience. Now we invite from Vietnam, the Minister of Finance, Minister Zong, to speak on the financing mechanisms that have been utilized for successful COVID-19 response, especially when the economy has reduced government revenue. Over to you, please, Minister Zong. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to convey my thanks to ADB for the invitation to share experiences from Vietnam today. At this meeting, I would like to share some experiences in financial mechanisms adopted by Vietnam in response to COVID-19 pandemic in the context that the revenue of state budget is decreasing as follows. Firstly, we prioritize budget for preventive health care measures. In Vietnam, we have a proverb 
prevention is always better than cure. And by this saying, for a long time ago, Vietnamese people have reiterated the importance of prevention rather than medical treatment. Since the Vietnam economic de development is still at low level, in our perception as well as in practice, we consider preventive health care as a fundamental. Every year we prioritize to allocate proper budget for health care to ensure that the growth of expenditure on health care should be higher than average growth of total expenditures, in which we allocate at least 30% of health expend expenditure for prevention at the grassroots level. To comply with the principles that public health care would be merely sheltered by the state budget, the examination and treatment would be borne by health insurance fund and individuals. And then the primary uh, care is uh, borne by the health insurance fund and individuals in order to reach the target of USC to 92%. Currently, Vietnam is accelerating the state budget restructuring in healthcare to mobilize more resources to implement the comprehensive work of protecting, caring, and improving people's health status, especially for the social protection beneficiaries, ethnic minority people, and those living in mountainous and remote areas. The second thing I want to share with you is that we effectively utilize all available on site resources. Since the first confirmed case of COVID-19 in the world, the government has instructed all the ministries and sectors to prepare facilities for prevention and treatment uh, following the four on the spot uh, motto, prevention, isolation and treatment on site. On spot demand by its provision of facilities, equipment, medicines and protective measures and provide funds on site. And finally, mobilizing human resources on the spot by doing so, we have ensured that all the resources for pandemic prevention and control in the manner. Recently, the state budget has paid for the isolation and also treatment for confirmed cases in Vietnam. Thirdly, we promote the national tradition in social responsibility and supporting in the prevention and fight against the COVID-19 pandemic. The Vietnamese people have tradition of patriot and humanity. Anytime the country is in difficulties, this tradition is, is uh, multiple. And with the spirit of considering human health and life as the most critical importance, the General Secretary and President Nguyen Phu Trọng made a call to people in and outside the country for consolidation for their wills and taking action and effectively control the pandemic. Each citizen of Vietnam is a soldier in the battle against the COVID-19. Responding to the call of the, our General Secretary, just after a short time, thousands of collaborators and volunteers who are um, students of final year and retiree uh, have joined the anti-pandemic campaign. And the local and international organizations, individual and businesses, communities, through the text message via the switchboard, have directly shared and donated money, supplies, and medical equipment with value amounting to 100 million US dollars to timely support to a cost of prevention and control. Fourthly, we have promptly responded to the COVID-19 pandemic. Vietnam persistently implements the dual goals strategy, that is to uh, preventing and combating the COVID epidemic and also surpassing difficulties in production and trade, socioeconomic recovery. The government does not allow disruption in economic activities and try to stabilize the macroeconomic fundamentals, curb inflation, sustain the economic balance. In particular, firstly, we have implemented the social security support package uh, around 27 billion US dollars to uh, those who are affected by COVID-19 and suffer from severe income loss, unemployment, underemployment, and insecurity of minimum living standard. Secondly, we provided exemption reduction and re deferrals of taxes, fees, charges around $10 billion for those who are uh, affected by COVID-19. We also exempted import tax for medical supplies and equipment for prevention, including medical masks, send sanitizers, materials for producing face masks, uh, sanitizers, and the other necessary equipment. We also provided deferral of the payment of corporate income tax and land renters, reduced 
import and export tariffs to remove difficulties in production and export activities. We supplemented corporate income tax incentives to support for small and micro enterprises and private sector. We also waived tax on agricultural land use, increased the level of deduction of personal income tax family circumstance, and thereby reducing tax obligation for people. We also suspended implementing retroactive measures to uh, corporate income tax to socialize uh, industries. And also we uh, stored and provisioned essential medical uh, supplies and equipment. And finally, we accelerated the reform in administrative procedures. Ladies and gentlemen, the Ministry of Finance of Vietnam highly welcomed ADB uh, and highly appreciate ADB's organization of this uh, annual meeting. And we would like to suggest that the ministers of health and uh, have finance from other countries with their strengths and advantages will continue support to Vietnam to improve capacity in preventive health care, shared information, exchange treatment experiences and research and produce vaccine as well as promote economic recovery and sustainability. As an active and responsible member of the international community, Vietnam express our concern, sympathy and making our efforts to cooperate and coordinate with other countries which are severely affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, in my perspective, in these circumstances, global solidarity and collaboration are essential measures for the ultimate victory with, of the war against the COVID-19 pandemic. I would like to give my best wishes to you all. Thank you so much. Very, very much indeed, Minister Zong. It's, again, very good to hear of Vietnam's experience. Now we go on to our third speaker, Minister Park, who is Minister of Health of the Republic of Korea, to speak on the public health systems measures, for example, surveillance of disease and service delivery that's been needed for an effective COVID-19 response. So over to you, please, Minister Park. Thank you, moderator. Honorable ministers, distinguished delegates, COVID-19 has not only affected the health sectors and our society at large, it has also severely affected the global economy. It is greatly meaningful to be sharing the experiences Korea has acquired through our health system with the health and the finance ministers gathered here today. Korea's health system aims to minimize the social disruptions caused by infectious diseases and gradually restore our economy. Hoping Korea's experiences will be helpful in fighting not only COVID-19, but other future infectious diseases. I would like to share some insights we've acquired throughout the outbreak. To effectively respond to COVID-19, first, we need a surveillance system to contain the spread of a virus. Instead of blocking our borders and locking down our country, Korea abided by the principle of openness. Korea has been preventing further spread of the virus by building a surveillance system with local communities, conducting epidemiological investigation and isolating confirmed patients. Let me be more specific. We are conducting our efforts, we are concentrating our efforts on primary detection. Um, so, Okay. 
All right. Mm, okay. Uh, let me be more specific. We are concent concentrating our efforts on timely detection of confirmed cases by actively monitoring high-risk groups and facilities and operating screening clinics by day and night while maintaining our diagnostic test capacity. Alongside these efforts, we are conducting rapid epidemiological investigations and uh, managing self-isolated patients in a sustainable manner to strengthen our surveillance system. Second, it is important that our healthcare systems remain flexible in the face of unexpected outcomes. In case of COVID-19, we needed to adopt a flexible approach and we had no prior information on the diseases. We were able to do so by being creative and innovative. In the beginning of the outbreak, the Korean government thought hospitalizing all confirmed patients is necessary. However, a number of confirmed cases spiked in certain regions. We struggled to secure sufficient hospital beds. Thus, we classified patients by their severity. We hospitalized the patients with severe symptoms and arranged separate treatment centers called residential treatment centers for asymptotic patients and patients with mild symptoms. We were able to optimize the use of limited medical resources to treat patients and prevent the disease from further spread, spreading. Lastly, I want to emphasize that we needed to invest in healthcare system. A robust health system minimizes the severe impact infectious disease have on our society and makes the people and the economy more resilient to crisis. If people avoid testings and the treatments because of high medical costs, the country will be burdened with much higher costs in the future. Also, infectious disease can result in unexpected outcomes depending on their clinical characteristics and the number of infected patients. That is why it is essential that we preemptively invest in relevant facilities and uh, human resources. For instance, accounting necessary treatment facilities for emergency patients and the patients with severe symptoms is costly and time consuming. Therefore, we need to have a mid to long term plan to make investments ahead of time. By expanding the capacity of our health care system, we are investing in not only the safety of our people, but also in the sustainable developments of our society. Unfortunately, even at this moment, the number of fatalities caused by COVID-19 is growing, and the medical professionals and other frontline workers are fiercely battling COVID-19. We did not start the crisis, but we sure can end it. I hope the international community will overcome these changing times, these challenging times together through unity and solidarity. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so, so much, Minister Park. Ending on that note,
of global solidarity. Thank you. Now, finally, but not least, may I invite Secretary Dominguez, who is the Secretary of Finance of the Philippines, to share a few words summarizing experiences on financing innovations that have been used to address COVID-19 and how it might apply going forward to push the UHC agenda even further. Secretary Dominguez, over to you, please. Thank you. His Excellency Taro Aso, Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Finance of Japan. Mr. Masatsugu Asakawa, President of the Asian Development Bank. My fellow ministers, distinguished guests, good morning. The past four years has prepared the Philippines for a challenging global economic environment. Before the COVID-19 pandemic struck, we had built a strong fiscal position. In 2019, our bold reforms in tax policy and administration enabled us to bring our revenue effort to 16.1% of GDP, the highest in more than two decades. In the same year, we brought down our debt to GDP ratio to a historic low of 39.6%. This strong fiscal position gave us headroom that's needed to reallocate budget items and quickly assess emergency financing to fight the pandemic. With our historically high credit ratings for development partners and commercial markets continue to provide us financing at very low rates and tight spreads and longer repayment periods. We are grateful to the Asian Development Bank for extending immediate and much needed budgetary support to the Philippines. These borrowings will help us cover our revenue shortfall resulting from the slowdown of economic activities due to the lockdowns. We have quickly put together eco economic stimulus measures worth 42 billion US dollars or 11% of our GDP. These resources were allocated to boost our health system and to provide reliefs to sectors hardest hit by the pandemic. We were able to leverage excise tax collections from so-called SIL products to fund our universal health care program. We are the only administration in the Philippine history to have increased SIL taxes three times in the last four years. Tax increases on cigarettes, alcohol, and electronic nicotine devices shielded us from the worst of the pandemic's impact on our revenue collections. Continuous improvements in our public health system are crucial to building the confidence of our people and our businesses to operate in the new economy. We remain committed to bolstering our public health infrastructure to fight this pandemic and prepare for future public health emergencies. The wild card in all our planning and strategizing is the virus itself. It dictates the timeline for all of us. We have no knockout punch until a safe and effective vaccine is ready for mass distribution. With a number of ongoing developments of COVID-19 vaccines worldwide, we encourage the Asian Development Bank to take, a, to take on a lead role in ensuring accessibility of these treatments to those who need it most. We suggest that the Asian Development Bank take the initiative to convene a working group with the World Health Organization, the World Bank, the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, and other multilateral bodies to assist developing member countries in assessing these vaccines. The working group could establish a common information portal that will provide member countries with updates on COVID-19 vaccine development, a coordinated approach to the procurement of the vaccines and mobilization of financing for this purpose will greatly help developing countries restore the, by that, the vitality of their economies. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Secretary Dominguez for that clear of working with each other, national governments 
and with the multilateral agencies. Because we are running on a very tight schedule, I think what we will do is now to pass the time back to Dr. Osewe of ADB, who will now go on with the rest of the sessions. Over to you, Patrick. Thank you very much, uh, ministers uh, and Dr. Leung for a very rich uh, discussion. Uh, I would like now to transition to our second discussion topic and invite Dr. Poonam Singh, WHO Regional Director for Southeast Asia, to set the scene on UHC as a foundation for resilient health system. Dr. Singh, please. Excellencies, when countries and partners invest in universal health coverage, they invest in the most efficient way to create healthier, more health secure countries and a healthier and more health secure world. For every dollar invested in UHC, the return is delivered many times over. First, due to increases in overall population health and well-being, the productivity of the jobs and the poverty reduction they promote. And second, because when the quality and reach of health services improves and can better mitigate or manage acute threats while maintaining essential health services. It is for this reason that since 2014, achieving UHC and scaling up emergency risk management have been among the WHO Southeast Asia region's eight flagship priorities. After more than nine months of responding to the COVID-19 pandemic, the evidence is clear. Across the Southeast Asia region, across Asia and across the world, countries that have made sustained long-term investments in UHC have health systems that are more resilient and which have more effectively controlled the spread of the virus, maintained essential health services and mitigated economic shock. The experiences that excellencies shared on Monday and today bears this out. In countries with access to free testing and care, like Bhutan, the Republic of Korea, Malaysia, people have sought timely diagnosis and treatment, which has minimized spread, maximized information and surveillance, and ensured all people get the care they need. Consider that Bhutan, which is constitutionally committed to achieving UHC, has reported zero COVID-19 deaths and has one of the world's highest testing rates at more than 150,000 tests per million people. Countries with strong primary health care that is supported by adequate human resources have been able to efficiently repurpose health workers to respond to the pandemic while also maintaining essential health services. Just this morning, Her Excellency, the Honorable Minister of Health of Sri Lanka, stated that Sri Lanka till now has reported just 13 deaths and none among healthcare workers. Sri Lanka has one of the highest densities of health workers in Asia at 31.8 doctors, nurses, and midwives per 10,000 population. Countries that have made progress towards UHC have logistics and supply chains that are more secure, efficient, and transparent, and can rapidly meet surge needs and also more rapidly adapt and roll out innovations, which is reflected in the massive expansion of telemedicines across several countries. Crucially, countries that are committed to UHC have successfully mobilized the whole of government, the whole of society buy-in required to effectively respond to the pandemic. Thailand, which invests 15% of public expenditure on health, 
has for many years promoted public ownership of health through its National Health Assembly and via high-impact public health communication. When countries invest in UHC, they invest in the firmest foundation for a healthier, more health-secure world. But they also invest in the resilience of their economy and the sustainable and equitable development it brings. On Monday, the WHO Supported Global Preparedness Monitoring Board released its report, A World in Disorder. The board estimates that it would take 500 years to spend as much on preparedness as the world is currently losing due to the impact of COVID-19. Today, tomorrow, and for many months and even years, countries will face immense physical pressures that provide hard cho choices and difficult trade-offs. The latest projections from global financial institutions suggest that in 2020, most countries in Asia Pacific would face a decrease in GDP, which could exceed 10%. Thus, even if the slice of government expenditure that health spread spending accounts for remains the same, the pie itself may be smaller, and that will have an impact on many lives and livelihoods. That is why not only sustaining, but also scaling up smart, efficient investments in UHC is so important because they will pay for themselves and deliver many, many times over. I leave you with three key messages on how countries and partners can take immediate fiscal action to strengthen the COVID-19 response and build health system resilience into the recovery and beyond. First, prioritizing health in government budgets, not only in the short term, so that COVID-19 response is strengthened, but also over the medium term, so that UHC is advanced and health systems become more resilient and are better prepared for acute events in the future. Second, improving value for money in health, for example, by investing in primary health care and pro-poor initiatives that protect and promote the health of vulnerable groups. And third, mobilizing domestic revenues for health via pro-health taxes, for example, on tobacco, alcohol, and sugar-sweetened beverages as was shared today by Philippines. Such levies will not only generate additional resources for health, but also produce healthier, happier populations. UHC is an investment. It is not a cost. We must make the case as if lives depend on it, because they do. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Singh, for such lovely remarks. And next, uh, we'll hear from our colleague uh, at the World Bank. And it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Muhammad Ali Pate, the Glo Global Director for Health, Nutrition, and Population at the World Bank. Dr. Pate, please. Thank you, Patrick. Excellencies, honorable ministers, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted to join you virtually for this important discussion. Thanks to the ADB, WHO, and Government of Japan for inviting us to speak. Human capital, the knowledge, skills, and health that people accumulate over their lives has been a key factor behind the sustainable economic growth and poverty reduction rates of many countries in the 20th century, especially in Asia. The good news is that in most countries, we saw improvements in the last decade as countries invested in their people. But this progress is now threatened by a crisis of unprecedented proportions. The COVID-19 pandemic threatens to push between 7 to 100 million people into extreme poverty and decades of human capital gains and progress towards the sustainable development goals may be lost. 
a child born be before the COVID-19 pandemic struck was already only likely to achieve on average 56% of her or his potential in terms of productivity as a future worker. In the current context, economic hardships for households as well as fiscal constraints to delivering vital public services in health and education may leave entire generations at a disadvantage. An advancing universal health coverage is integral to improving human capital formation and boosting productivity now more than ever. Investing in people means investing in essential primary and community health services, such as maternal, neonatal, child health interventions, including immunization and nutrition. It also means investing in the key infrastructure that is needed for delivering of basic services and good health for entire populations. Essential preventive and curative health services boost workers' productivity throughout their lifetimes, often with rapid impact. Advancing universal health coverage also means the scaling up of prepaid and pooled financing to reduce out-of-pocket payments with significant positive benefits for poverty reduction. Already before the pandemic, people in developing countries paid over half a trillion dollars out of pocket for healthcare, causing financial hardship for more than 900 million across the globe and pushing nearly 90 million into extreme poverty every year. Ensuring quality and affordable health services is a struggle in many countries, and we must urgently address that even more so now. Financial protection has other benefits. People no longer have, need to sell their assets or borrow to meet their health payments when they have financial protection. They conserve their resources so they can spend or invest in other ways. Financial protection also allows sick and poor to protect, maintain and improve their health and increase their earnings. As a result, income inequality falls if there's financial protection. UHC goals are being undermined by the current pandemic and by its broader economic impacts. Our analysis at the World Bank Group estimates that growth in public spending for health will decline across most low and middle income countries in the region, including becoming negative in some cases, risking reversal of gains that have been made towards expanding universal health coverage in recent years. As countries emerge slowly from the lockdowns, they must determine the best way forward for their health systems and economies in the face of huge uncertainty. We need to make sure countries mobilize the necessary funding to respond to the COVID-19 and also its secondary impact while building sustainable and resilient health systems that will prepare countries for future outbreaks. Because COVID-19 is one, but it's not going to be the last public health threat that we will face. Finance ministers must sufficiently prioritize health in the budget and health ministers must demonstrate that funds are spent efficiently and effectively. Many countries will also need to consider additional revenue options, such as the pro-health taxes that the WHO regional director just mentioned. The World Bank president, David Malpas, in his remarks to the G20 ministers uh, in July uh, this year, called for extending the debt service suspension initiative through the end of 2021, making the scope as broad as possible and also considering options for debt reduction, resolution and transparency. Many low and middle income country governments, including Indonesia, Philippines, Lao PDR, Fiji and Myanmar, spend more on servicing public debt than they do on health. Debt relief is an important way to create fiscal space to finance the response to COVID and to, uh, to provide essential health services and to build back stronger and more resilient health systems. When COVID-19 emerged as a global threat, the World Bank responded with the largest and fastest crisis response in its history. Emergency operations have now reached more than 100 countries all over the world, home to over 70% of the world's population. We have allocated up to $160 billion in financial support over 15 months, focusing on four priorities. Saving lives threatened by the pandemic, protecting the poor and most vulnerable, helping save jobs and businesses, and working to build 
more resilient recovery. In addition, we launched the Health Emergency Preparedness and Response Multi-Donor Trust Fund with a generous initial contribution of $100 million by the government of Japan as an anchor donor. We must do more to link UHC to global health security, to pandemic preparedness as a key learning for coming out of the COVID-19 pandemic. By strengthening primary health care, we can advance UHC and build a first line of defense against outbreaks through rapid detection and response. More and better investments are necessary now to create stronger, more resilient, and more equitable health system to save lives now, and also to prevent further reversals. We will continue to work closely with our counterparts and partners across the region, turn this crisis into an opportunity for countries to build back stronger, faster, and more inclusively. Thank you very much for the opportunity to join you and hear this discussion this morning. Thank you. Over to you, Patrick. Thank you so, so much, Dr. Pate, for those remarks. And thank you, Dr. Singh, for your remarks as well. So now we move on to interventions from three ministers from member states. We have first the Minister of Finance, Minister Nazara from Indonesia. We have two ministers of health, Minister Hipkins from New Zealand and Minister Wonkianabete from Fiji. And they will address how does UHC enable DMCs to be resilient to health and economic shocks. So without further ado, may I now invite Minister Nazara, who is the Vice Minister of Finance of Indonesia, to speak on what investments in UHC enable quicker economic recovery from COVID-19. Minister Nazara, please. Very good morning to all of you, uh, Excellencies, Honorable uh, uh, Deputy Prime Minister, also President uh, ADB Asakawa, and also uh, Honorable Ministers. Uh, very uh, happy that uh, I'm, I can speak uh, before all of you in this occasion. And let me give you uh, a brief snapshot about what happened in Indonesia when we, uh, uh, we had this COVID-19 uh, pandemic starting uh, maybe around February or March uh, this year. Immediately, we understand that this is going to impact the whole uh, life of uh, Indonesians. And immediately that we know that uh, the government of Indonesia, we must change and we must do adjust our budget. Uh, uh, we uh, look at, uh, we look into our budget and then immediately also looking at the different local government's budget because of the autonomous regions, 500 of uh, local autonomous region in Indonesia, we are encouraging, we encourage them to revise their budget immediately to put priorities on the health sectors. Uh, and of course, in this, uh, during this pandemic, it is not easy to revise the budget. Uh, I mean, by uh, anticipating what kind of pandemic that we are going to, uh, we are going to, to have. In the central government, we revise the budget twice. And during the two times revisions of the budget up to now, uh, different other things uh, happens. Budget is not immediately can be implemented. Uh, we, although we uh, can do it immediately without having to have a long discussion with the parliament, but the parliament political uh, the politics must also be uh, is part of the of the picture, and then comes after that the implementation. And uh, for to, uh, to to fight this uh, pandemic, the whole picture, we have our national economic uh, recovery plan and comprising around uh, 40 billion US dollar. And health sector is one of the most important uh, element of uh, that national economic uh, reform plan. Uh, other than that, uh, I can uh, quickly mention about the social protection, uh, protecting the poor and the vulnerable, and then also protecting the micro and small medium enterprises, the corporate sector, tax breaks, uh, import uh, duty breaks, and also additional spending on others. Now, let me uh, focus on the health. Uh, on the health uh, uh, intervention that uh, the government of Indonesia put in the, in the budget, 
Uh, it is very also important to note that the universal health coverage is helping us to uh, manage the uh, health services to the to the people. Right now, in Indonesian uh, coverage of the health services, the our national health uh, insurance program is around 84% of the population. Now, what are we anticipating about this 84% uh, of the population that are already in our national health insurance system? Number one, their income is declining. And because their income is declining, there is always a possibility that the uh, individual payment can go lower. That will pose a problem to the, to the system. So the government decided to provide uh, uh, a help, a support to make sure that the, the universal health coverage uh, uh, population does not come down. And in fact, it can go up to a uh, uh, higher uh, percentage. It is also very important that uh, during this pandemic, people, start, people understand even uh, better the need to have the insurance. We have to use this uh, momentum to ensure that uh, the universal health coverage is uh, go higher uh, above the 80 percent, uh, go to the true uh, universal health coverage of 100 percent coverage. So that is number one. Number two, uh, universal health coverage is not only about 100 percent of the population. It is about the services. It is important to make sure that uh, the universal health coverage is also uh, accompanied by uh, quality health services to the people. And this pandemic, uh, during this pandemic, the people need them. So it is uh, important that uh, we are instructing to our national uh, uh, health uh, insurance agency to uh, make sure that they, they have a better connection with the hospital and health providers to make sure that the services is also uh, improved. The national budget and also local government budget are providing money for that. And we are uh, asking our agency to connect with the health facilities, hospital, and other facilities to improve the health, uh, the health services, the quality of the health services. Going out of this uh, pandemic, I believe that uh, we still a uh, very, very big uncertainties that we are facing. Nevertheless, the fact that uh, uh, if, if a country has a high uh, health coverage uh, and also a universal health coverage, it will be a good starting point in order to do massive vaccination in the future. We are hopeful that the vaccine will be invented and will be distributed. And it is very important to conduct the vaccination at as massive as possible. In a country like Indonesia, 270 million people, it is very important to have a system in order to prepare the system for a proper uh, vaccinations uh, in the future against this. Uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Yeah, our universal health coverage and the agency, the health facilities and hospitals, health providers should be part of that massive uh, uh, feature of vaccination uh, for us. So let me stop here. Uh, I think those are a very brief uh, uh, remarks that uh, I can tell you about the uh, relationship between the budget and also the health, uh, universal health coverage and also fighting the pandemic in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much, Minister Nazara. And now moving to our second intervention in this panel, may I invite Minister Hipkins, Minister of Health of New Zealand, to speak on UHC investment that would enable a successful COVID-19 response. Minister Hipkins, please. Kia ora koutou and uh, good afternoon in New Zealand uh, to all of you. Uh, Excellencies, Ministers, Dr. Kazai, Dr. Singh, it's a pleasure to join you today and contribute to what I think is a very, very important discussion. I'd like to add my thanks uh, and a sincere appreciation to the Asian Development Bank, uh, Minister Tao, the Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Finance of Japan uh, for extending me the invitation to speak with you today. New Zealand's got a long history of universal health coverage, or UHC for short. We're one of the first countries to establish a universal tax-funded national health service.
we also remain one of the only uh, countries to have a no fault accident compensation scheme, which also covers visitors to New Zealand. So no citizen can be denied treatment in public hospitals uh, and all citizens have insurance through government funded universally accessible health services. Uh, we do know that this coverage varies by income need, location and type of services and addressing inequity uh, within our country remains a core focus of area for us. Before moving on to how universal healthcare coverage has supported our COVID-19 response, I do want to briefly describe the three key areas of that response. Firstly, our COVID-19 alert level system helps people, people to understand the current level of risk and the restrictions that must be followed. The levels are based on the latest scientific information and knowledge um, about the effectiveness of intervention measures here in New Zealand and elsewhere. So our highest alert level, alert level four, entails a full lockdown with people who are instructed to stay home other than for essential personal movement uh, and travel is severely limited. The second uh, line of our COVID-19 response are our border restrictions and mandatory isolation. So everybody coming into the country has to go into mandatory isolation for at least 14 days uh, when they arrive in New Zealand. And then thirdly, we've had a very clear communication strategy uh, that's based on trust, transparency, early announcements, and that's resulted in very high levels of public support and buy-in for the public health measures that we've put in place. The success of the measures we put in place are evident. Up until just recently, on the 11th of August, we'd gone 102 days where there had been no new cases of community transmission of COVID-19 in New Zealand. Unfortunately, the emergence of four community cases from an unknown source in Auckland, our largest city, on the 11th of August, meant that we immediately activated our resurgence plan and we moved Auckland to alert level three uh, and the rest of the country to alert level two, which placed some further restrictions on large gatherings uh, and, and required additional distancing and protection measures around the rest of the country. So we're now working to contain that subsequent community outbreak. And as of today, we currently have 77 active cases that are restricted either to the Auckland region or to our managed isolation and quarantine facilities where new arrivals are staying. Only 44 of those active cases are community-based cases and they are all in Auckland. We've also introduced uh, additional public health measures, such as the introduction of mandatory wearing of masks on domestic flights and public transport like trains, buses and ferries. Having established universal health coverage allows New Zealand and has allowed us to alleviate the cost barriers that would otherwise impede our control of the pandemic. We've ensured that COVID-19 testing is free of charge for everybody, including visitors to New Zealand. We've also been able to set up uh, readily and regularly additional testing stations to improve the accessibility of testing and that's help us, helped us to facilitate early case detection, identify the contacts of those who have tested positive and then rapidly isolate those people to stop the spread of the virus. Another important aspect of our approach to universal health coverage is the recognition of the inequalities in access to and the delivery of health care to our Indigenous population, Māori New Zealanders, and to our Pacific population and other ethnic minority groups, and we've been determined to address that. So we went into our response to COVID-19, knowing that if we weren't proactive, these groups could potentially be among the most affected. A specific example of the work that we've done to combat this is the targeted testing we've done of our Māori and Pacific populations. So we have a testing rate of around 146 and 246 per thousand respectively in our Māori and Pacific communities compared to a rate of around 135 per thousand people across the country overall. This is one of the lessons we learned from the recent measles epidemic that we dealt with here in New Zealand, which also underlined, underlined the responsibilities that we've got to our Pacific neighbours. So looking ahead, New Zealand's continuing to pursue our strategy of COVID-19 elimination, a sustained approach to keep it out and to stamp it out. Uh, we do this through our continued border restrictions and our public health measures, which are regularly updated to reflect the latest scientific evidence and reckon, uh, recommendations. Another key focus 
books going forward, as it is for all countries, will of course be uh, our vaccination and immunisation strategy. New Zealand's overall approach to COVID-19 has been that the very best economic re response that we can have to COVID-19 is a very, very good health response. And that's what New Zealand has been focused on. So thank you very much. Thank you very, very much indeed, Minister from New Zealand, Minister Hipkins. Now, last but not least, in this round of interventions, we welcome the Minister of Health and Medical Services of Fiji, Minister Wankenabete, to speak on the topic of how the non-COVID-19 essential care services have been affected during the pandemic. So over to you now, please, Minister Wankenabete. Thank you for this opportunity to uh, uh, discuss at this uh, high level discussion and also I, uh, uh, I uh, uh, say hello also and greet uh, the Honourable uh, Ministers and also uh, representatives from WHO and ADB and thank you for this opportunity also. The, um, as we speak now, uh, Fiji has now gone through 152 days, today is the 152nd day since our last case of community transmission. Uh, we have, uh, at the moment, uh, three border quarantine cases, which are cases that came through the border and they remain at the border and poses no threat to the community at large. And uh, we have uh, relaxed many of the restrictions that we have put in place initially. And uh, so as to speak, the nation as a whole is back into the new normal. Schools have uh, opened all throughout the country in businesses and the local economy is flourishing in the new normal. The COVID-19 pandemic has impacted many aspects of health services in Fiji, and uh, like every other country in, in, in the region and also the entire world. And the Fijian government, the Minister of Health, uh, in the initial stages of the response, agreed on prioritizing essential services that remain fully operational through the period of our first wave and the only wave of community transmission in Fiji. And during that time, services such as emergency health services, patient retrieval services, certain ambulatory services, crucial primary health care services, maternal child care services, and emergency surgical services. In essence, what happened was uh, two of Fiji's uh, largest city, they went on lockdown seven days uh, uh, apart from each other, and lockdowns of 14 days each. And as that was done, we mobilized our Ministry of, uh, of Health and also our doctors, nurses, and also the Allied Health to be able to move out of these two cities and actually run uh, two hospitals uh, small subdivision hospitals outside of uh, the two cities of Suwe and Lutoka as bellwether capable hospitals. And they were able to uh, achieve um, their purpose of being able to treat emergency uh, surgical services, intensive care, and so forth during the time in which those two cities were on lockdown. Uh, and, that's the, and at the primary healthcare level, health promotion, education, preventative, and outreach activities were put on halt due to the movement and gathering restrictions. And, and I believe we all understand uh, what this says entailed right throughout the world. This novel disease further reduced the limited access of vulnerable groups to healthcare because of the public sentiments, which manifested as fear and fear of the uncertainty. One of the, the biggest things that we did was roll out a massive communications campaign using social media, using mainstream media, but using uh, uh, boots on the ground so as to speak to move through communities uh, and into settlements and even into the outer islands in which we have 100 inhabited islands to be able to explain to the population as a whole as COVID uh, was in uh, a, the main island in Fiji, what it entailed and what um, the new normal would entail in terms of the personal and hand hygiene, the social distancing, and also the fact that uh, we wanted them to understand what uh, they will go through when it actually comes into their community, if ever it comes into their community. The services in all the primary health care clinics were downsized, and essential services such as chronic disease clinics, SOPD, maternal and child health clinics, wellness clinics, school visitations, and rehabilitation services such as domiciliary visits, follow-ups, and continuum of care were also stalled during this initial part of the lockdown and the restrictions. Apart from the reduction of services, our healthcare workers were deployed to man the necessary isolation facilities, the quarantine facilities with the military initially, and up until now, initially we had 600 members of the military assigned to us in the initial 
COVID-19, uh, uh, the only community uh, wave of community transmission that we had. And as we went back into the relaxation of uh, these restrictions, it's now come down to 200 military personnel that are manning essentially our border quarantine. Um, and we also rolled out the most um, a massive public health uh, community fever screening campaign ever, ever where we, uh, uh, we, we, we sent our people onto the ground and they uh, conduct the fever screening in 830,000 of our population. We have a population of 880,000, which is essentially about 96% of our population was screened with community fever screening. And also we had stationary uh, fever clinics in which members of the public that influenza like illness were able to come and we've seen and actually went back. Much needed ambulatory health services such as eye clinics and dental clinics were reduced to emergency service to mitigate the risk of aerosolizing, aerosolizing the virus in the clinics and potentially sharing the virus and ex exposing the health staff and other patients in the, in the facility. And as we speak, uh, these services have begun to come back into normal uh, in terms of the work that they do, in terms of the, 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 the dental and oral health, uh, work oral surgery, and also uh, the work in prosthetic, dental prosthetic. That's all come back to normal as I've said earlier, because we are COVID contained. The restrictions also limited uh, our people's ability to access secondary and tertiary healthcare offered in the main referral hospitals inside the lockdown areas. And as I've alluded to earlier, we had decentralized our services into selected subdivision hospitals. And in the case, as I've also alluded to, the two small subdivision hospitals became like uh, a secondary level healthcare services during the time of the lockdown to be able to provide that level of service uh, for those outside of the lockdown areas. The international border restriction and disruption in global supply chain impacted the supply of medicines, consumables, and medical equipment for our health facilities, where the delivery of supplies was affected. The ministry worked with our foreign affairs ministry and Fiji overseas missions to facilitate the transportation and delivery of needed supplies into the country. What has also helped is the fact that we have a national carrier called Fiji Airways, and as we speak, they run uh, 10 uh, freight flights uh, outside uh, to from Fiji uh, to our neighboring uh, countries such as Australia and New Zealand. And this has been able uh, to help us to be able to connect uh, in terms of bringing supplies back into the nation and also uh, with freight that's coming through our seaports. Our health system remodeling program allows for greater outreach and decentralization of services. The remodeled health delivery system will ensure that programs such as immunization and health screening that have been delayed during the pandemic will now pick up pace to regain full moment and cover for the lost crowd. Medical education and, and continuing professional development have been affected with an initial suspension in medical education for postgraduate trainees based at our training hospitals. Our staff has since been undertaking professional development through remote learning opportunities and on digital forums provided by the universities. Given our current COVID contained status, much of the health services have returned to normal or near normal functions. The ministry is fully advising and supporting the government's safe economic recovery strategies. And we are continuing to assess the regional and global pro progress of the pandemic and are poised to respond positively effectively to the ongoing evolution of the disease. I want to also state that uh, with the Man C uh, outbreak that, were, uh, that happened in our country in the early uh, period of 2018, and also uh, with uh, measles, which came at the end of last year, in which we um, vaccinated 500,000 of our po population uh, within uh, six weeks. We had 31 children that were sick and we had no deaths. Probably posted us in a good place and the learnings that we had from the measles epidemic and also the learnings that we had from men C allowed us to understand what are the services that are going to be stretched and how we can be able to respond, respond effectively so that we are meeting the needs of our normative functions and also the extra normative functions of COVID-19. I would like to thank the WHO and ADB for organizing this important forum and look forward to continuing to work towards normalization of essential health services towards our shared goal of being the healthiest and safest region. And in Fiji's case, we are a hub for the Pacific region. And as we speak, we have uh, patients that are coming from other countries within the Pacific seeking secondary health care within Fiji. So it is essential that we ensure that there is a normalization of essential health services. Thank you. 
Thank you so, so much, Minister Wanea Nabete. Thank you so much for your intervention. You have helped us to understand, along with six other fellow ministers of finance and of health, how each of your countries have met and risen to the COVID-19 challenge, both in your portfolios of directly dealing with, handling, managing the outbreak, as well as facilitating the resource mobilization, allowing your colleagues to do so on the front lines. You have given us much, much to reflect on as we prepare for the next months, perhaps up to a year of COVID-19 and beyond as we look to re-energize the UHC agenda, not only for health emergencies, but for health for all. So now I pass back the time to Dr. Osewe of ADB. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Leung and the ministers uh, for a very uh, informative uh, session. Uh, I would like to start by extending my sincere gratitude to all ministers uh, who have uh, represented and gathered here today. And uh, as, as, as you've heard from seven countries uh, regarding co co what the impact of COVID vac vaccine, there are many, many positive examples and success stories from our region. Since the transmission of COVID-19 is unlikely to be suppressed in the near future, it is essential that countries learn from one another and that effective measures are adapted and replicated. To that end, we have prepared, we have prepared case studies from across the region and also gotten feedback uh, from, uh, from, uh, from the ministers on Monday and also from, uh, uh, from feed, uh, feedback from uh, various uh, conversations and so on. And I would like to just summarize uh, what is it that we've had uh, to date. Uh, first, uh, that investment pre in pre uh, preventive health system is key. For example, in Vietnam, the minister indicated that there's a resolution that at least 30% of the health budget is spent on preventive medicine, and indeed prevention is better than cure. Second, the importance of strong primary health care cannot be overemphasized. Korea's robust local surveillance and active monitoring of high-risk groups has prevented extensive disease spread, and likewise in New Zealand, we had about the same, uh, the same issue of equitable and affordable access to primary care that have ensured that cases were rapidly detected and isolated. Third, securing sufficient financing for UHC and the health, uh, for the health sector is vital. In the case of Philippines, innovative financing through Syntax has helped secure funds for UHC and contributed to the country's strong fiscal position, which enabled pand pandemic response. In Indonesia, financing response has been targeted to support the health sector and ensure social protection for the most vulnerable and to stimulate economic recovery. And finally, the whole, uh, whole of society approach is essential. Sri Lanka uh, talked about the collaboration between health and security forces that has ensured the highest level of authority backed health decisions. In Fiji, similarly, emphasize the whole society approach that include various sectors, including tourism and travel. These are just a few uh, promising examples of drivers of successes that have been reflected across the region. However, there are few common uh, themes uh, that uh, we should reflect on. First, these are preemptive and prior they, they are preemptive and prioritize taking advantage of opportunities before the outbreak occurs to strengthen and reinforce system. Second, they are not one off investment, but rather reflect an ongoing commitment to building the comprehensive and high quality systems necessary to ensure UHC. In the coming months and years, finance ministers and health will uh, be forced to make both difficult and strategic decisions about how to obtain and deliver sufficient COVID-19 vaccine to the population. Once vaccines are available, careful consideration must be given to how they effectively, how to equitably deliver them. Uh, ADB is committed uh, to supporting vaccines and, and, and address some of the challenging issues that we are going to face uh, going forward. There's been tremendous innovation in collaboration to bring vaccines to the market. 
uh, to bring back vaccine to the market in a very short uh, time, more than any time in history. It's only through strengthening the health system, including public health infrastructure, that delivery vaccines uh, can be made possible. And also to have pandemic capacity that can, we can learn, so we can learn to coexist with the COVID-19 while also preparing for the next pandemic. We are not the first to come to this conclusion, nor are we the last to come to this conclusion. However, we must use this knowledge to seize the opportunity pre presented by COVID-19. Great societies shift, uh, societal shifts are often made in the wake of a crisis, but this requires strong leadership, flexibility, and deep commitment to invest and uh, to imagine the future. Japan and United Kingdom both implemented universal health coverage uh, during the recovery from World War II. As countries emerge from COVID-19, they should recognize the tremendous opportunity in front of us uh, to invest in UHC. ADB, working closely with WHO, GMOF, World Bank, and others, uh, reaffirm its commitment to supporting member countries to recover from COVID-19 and build resilience systems. As emphasized the Japan Deputy Prime Minister, by investing in health system, the pillars of UHC in Asia and the Pacific can emerge from this crisis as a more secure, inclusive, and resilient region. We are all taking, talking about the new normal. To envision a post-COVID-19 future, what will this new normal look like? Will it return to business as usual? Or will our children live in a world where universal access to healthcare is not only normal, but guaranteed? This choice is the heart of this deliberation and is one we must make together by committing to accelerate progress toward UHC. Today's meeting is an important first step in opening the dialogue in our region. But without sustaining and committing efforts, we run the risk of missing a critical window to take necessary steps to better prepare our, our, for the next pandemic and leave our children with a healthier and more secure future. I now welcome Yasumasa Fukushima, Japan Vice Minister of Health, to give closing remarks. Uh, okay. Um, that's again. Uh, Honorable Ministers, uh, distinguished delegates, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Dr. Fukushima Yasumasa, uh, Chief Medical and Global Health Officer, uh, Vice Minister for Health, Ministry of Health, Labor and Welfare of Japan. Uh, as a co-sponsoring country of this uh, symposium, uh, allow me to uh, make a closing remark on behalf of my minister, uh, who could not attend this meeting today. Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to express my sincere gratitude uh, to Honorable Finance and Health Ministers and uh, distinguished expert of the uh, international organizations uh, for having this meeting. Uh, Japan believes USC as a uh, vital pillar of uh, international cooperation. Uh, therefore, Japan has taken uh, initiatives uh, in global fora uh, such as G7, G20, and the uh, UN uh, General Assembly uh, to promote USC. Uh, I deeply appreciate today's meeting, uh, which has a, a momentum for USC in the Asia Pacific region. Uh, COVID-19 brought a, a significant impact on people's health, economy, and society all over the world. Uh, during today's meeting, uh, we shared among member countries uh, which lessons uh, learned from uh, this crisis. Uh, to uh, revitalize the economy in the era of new trauma, uh, our resilient health system, which enables uh, effective infection, infection control, is uh, prerequisite. Uh, during today's meeting, uh, we also shared the view that uh, UHC, uh, UHC is a, a foundation for a resilient health system. Uh, as uh, Minister of Finance, uh, Mr. Aso, uh, emphasize in the uh, opening remark, uh, we need to uh, feel, uh, further invest uh, in institutional frameworks uh, to support USC, development of human resources, and improvement for health infrastructures. Uh, in addition, to uh, leverage the promotion of USC, joint effort of finance and health uh, ministries are urged more than ever. Uh, we look forward to seeing a realization of these collaborations in uh, concrete forms uh, at regional and national levels. 
collaboration among uh, international organizations uh, would also bring a synergistic effect. Uh, in particular, uh, we see a huge potential for uh, collaboration between WHO and ADB. Uh, while uh, WHO supports uh, elabora elaboration of norms and standards in health, ADB finances uh, human resources development and uh, infrastructure in health. Uh, this partnership could uh, catalyze uh, uh, emphasize, uh, enhancement of USC uh, finance and health system in the region. Uh, I hope to ask uh, further cooperation between finance ministries, uh, health ministries, and the international organizations uh, to achieve USC in uh, 2030 together. Thank you very much for attention. Thank you so much. Uh, on behalf of uh, ADB, uh, WHO, and Japan Ministry of Finance, uh, I would like to th thank all honorable ministers, uh, distinguished guests, uh, all our panelists, and all our speakers for a very successful meeting today. I wish you all the best as we move forward uh, to collaborate to ensure that we, we support uh, our region to accelerate progress towards UHC. Thank you very much.